a rundown of what uh of what happened last week. So essentially, I'll cover two main events that we had, and both of these events were on Friday. Uh, the first one being the ISM. Oh, sorry, the second one being the ISM. The first one being the NFP, right? Uh, because what we had for NFP, the data actually came in greater than expected. So that actually sent the, the dollar up, but then it's we saw a rebound lower in the dollar. And one of the reasons we saw a rebound lower in the dollar uh, was after the ISM uh, data. And essentially, if you're not if you're not familiar with the ISM, ISM it's the Institute of Supply Management. Uh, it's U.S. data. Uh, it's specifically for the U.S. economy. Okay, let me see. Someone just sent a message in the chat. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me clearly? Yeah, we are talking about. Hello, my king. Oh, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Oh, sorry, man. I was, yeah, how are you? Apologies, apologies, guys. No, I was trying to unmute, but then it, it, it kept saying uh, you did not give uh, permission or something like that. So I was oh, getting okay. a funny message. This time. Yeah, apologies. Oh, okay. No problem, no problem, no problem. But you, but you okay. haven't missed much because we're just getting started. No. no, no, I think I did not miss anything. Yeah. Yeah. We're just getting started. So essentially, I just yeah, want to yeah. go through the two main key events uh, for last week, which mostly impacted the dollar. Uh, so I just want to go into the ISM services. And then we'll also look at... We'll also look at uh, the NFP. And then most importantly, what are we expecting moving forward? So... If I go into the ISM non-manufacturing. Uh, okay, so that we so that you can be able to see the data as well. Yeah, non-manufacturing PMI. So I sent this chart in the group. Uh, I don't know if you if, if you recall this chart. Yeah. I sent this chart yep. in the group. Right, uh, and the reason why it was because uh, it's key to understand. Remember, with PMIs, a reading above fifty means that the economy is, is expanding and growing. A reading below fifty means that economy is contracting. Right, especially with the services ISM. If it's below forty nine point seven, uh, it means that 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 economy is contracting. If it if it remains below that point in a for a longer time or a longer period, but essentially. The reason why we saw the market downturning is because the ISM services or the services orders, they form close to 90% of the US economy. So I need you to picture that. If, if there is a contraction in the services, PMI or in the services sector, it affects almost 90% of the US economy in terms of orders, right? So that's how significant and how important it is, which is why when we got the mess in the numbers, where numbers were expected to come in at 52.6 from 52.7 previously in November, but they came in at 50.6. So close to the midline of 50 points, right? And what we can also take note of or take away from that is the fact that we saw in 2001, this is the dot-com bubble, when we had a mild recession in 2001, ISM was already dipping. And once it came close to 50 and below, that is when, it, it how can I put it? Essentially, it preceded a recession, right? Remember, there's been talks of a recession uh, since 2023. And now we're also starting to see that we are having ISM data that is, is pointing to the, down, to the downside. As you can see, it peaked uh, around 2021, I think. That is when it peaked, 2021, early 2022, and it has been decreasing since. So the key takeaway here is that if we look at historical behavior of the ISM and keeping in mind that it, it forms almost 90% of the U.S. economy in terms of, serv in terms of orders, the services sector or the services sector, then that means that it going down is what it should, it should, it should, grab our attention, we should pay attention to it. So in 2001, during the dot-com uh, bubble or mild recession, 
it had already been going down and once it dipped below 50 because this is the midline the 50 midline I'm, I'm hoping everyone can see this is the 50 if we look yeah. left, you can see the readings here so when that happened we had what a couple of months later or we had what we had the dot-com bubble the mild recession came into 20 2007 2009 we had we had what the depression right we also saw it declining below 50 around 2000 and 2007 and then we also had what we also had a, a recession that followed after also 2020 we had covid right and we also what it had already been going lower yes it spiked up but then we saw it dip below 50 and then that is when we had we had that recession as well so even now the last time it dipped below 50 was around, I think it was around March in 2023. Uh, but then it slightly, it immediately reversed after that. So now it's back towards the 50 range. So moving forward, it will be very important to see the next two readings that we're going to have uh, for January as well as for February. So the one that we had was for December. So remember, every data is like for the prior month, not for the current month that we're in. So the data that we'll be getting for in February will be for January, so on and so forth. So moving forward, it will be very important for us to pay attention to the trend, especially because it forms a big chunk of the US economy. And then what we've seen historically before or in times leading up to the recession, it's when it would dip below 50. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So that is that is why I paid much much importance to it, and that is why we saw the the reversal in 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 the in in the in the US uh in, or in the dollar pays after the ISM. Whereas when we had NFP, uh, what happened with NFP uh with this uh, we saw that the numbers were good, right? Even though yes, there there is an argument that numbers will be re revised lower because previously they had been revised lower uh for all the other market uh. Because remember, it, it has been coming coming out greater than expected, which means that it has been showing us that the U.S. economy is what, or specifically the labor market, is resilient and strong. And remember, the, the, there's, there's two, there's two uh, in terms of when it comes to the Federal Reserve, they have a dual mandate. And the dual mandate simply means there's two mandates. The, ma the first mandate is that they want to do what? they want to make sure that they achieve price stability. What is price stability? It means low inflation or inflation as close to the 2% target as possible. That is the first mandate of the Fed. The second mandate is the fact that they want to achieve what? Full employment, right? So now we're in a situation where employment, we can say they are within the ranges of full employment because I think full employment is anyway in the range of 4%. Uh, and right now, employment is or unemployment is sitting at 3.7%. Right. So that it means that it is below what what you'd consider as full employment. So that means that the labor market is quite strong. And then what does that mean as well? That means that there is a possibility of this strong labor market feeding into what? Feeding into demand and demand could see price stability being derailed. What is price stability? Inflation. Currently, we're seeing inflation is going down. So they are achieving their first they've achieved their they are achieving their first mandate of price stability because they bring inflation lower but then if the if the if the economy remains tight in terms of the labor market then that could still what that could cause a second round uh, a boost to inflation so looking at this data it is telling us that the consumer is still strong the consumer is still resilient why because unemployment is not increasing because in most recessions you'd have unemployment should shoot up yes COVID was a, a, a different case or a special case because it happened quickly. It happened rapidly. Inflation, uh, sorry, unemployment moved up to the regions of 14%. Uh, but in most recessions, leading into the recession, we see unemployment starting to tick up. Why? Because it goes hand in hand. When the interest rates go higher, they do what? They suppress what? They suppress businesses and they suppress who? The consumers or the economy itself. So that we it is expected that you'd get what? Higher inflation. Sorry, higher, higher, higher unemployment or unemployment rate going up. Is that clear? Yes. So so when we're getting when so when we're getting numbers like this where an expectation of of of, of the NFP it was 170,000, but it came in at 216, even if it can be revised lower, but that is still beating what market expectations. After a full year, 
plus of hiking interest rates. Because remember, they started hiking in, 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 in March 2022. And yes, there is a lag effect. What is a lag effect? It means that interest rates, they do not hike today and the economy starts feeling the, the effects of interest rate hikes tomorrow. It takes some time. But also that is it's showing us that what that the labor market is resilient. Unemployment was expected at 3.8. It came in at 3.7 unchanged. Uh, we saw participation rates slightly tick lower. But if we look at earnings, they're showing a boost. From 0 0.3, it came in at 0 0.4. From 3.9, expected it came in at 4.1. Remember, earnings is essentially what feeds into wages. So if wages go up, what does that mean? Inflation will also pick up higher, right? Because... Remember, because the framework is this, this is with regards to businesses. So for businesses, if inflate, if, if businesses seeing that their profit margins are, are being squeezed, what do they do? They increase what? They increase their prices and their prices is inflation. That is what inflation essentially is. So in this type of situation where we're seeing inflation going lower, but the labor market uh, remaining tight. So that means that there is a poss possibility of a boost in inflation. So that is essentially a sticky situation where the Fed finds finds themselves currently because, yes, economy is cooling. Yes, inflation is going lower, uh, but then the labor market is still strong and still, still tight. So there is a possibility or a potential of a rebound in inflation. Yes, they also have room to what to keep rates higher for longer because GDP is still strong. Uh, but if you're looking at the ISM services in terms of what we just showed right now which, or what we just looked at previously, that could build a case also for maybe that is why they came out in their December meeting and they considered or they raised that they now in the talks or they'll be having debates about when to actually start cutting interest rates. Does that now sort of make sense? Yep. Okay. So... That is where we stand with the dollar. That is where we stand with the Fed and specifically based on what happened last week, right? So another, another important thing then to look at is, of course, okay, the Fed is now, or the market is expecting the Fed to pivot, obviously, to cut interest rates. Uh, so what implications would that have, right? So it's very important to understand, okay, cutting of interest rates, as we know, it has the opposite effect to what we're seeing now. So cutting of interest rates will essentially boost the economy, right? So it means that lower lower interest rates will what will, will promote consumers or how or how or households to actually do what to actually look to to borrow money because interest rates will be going down, borrowing costs will be going down, businesses will also what will also be more inclined to borrow money or in terms of uh so that they can invest in equipment, also invest in hiring more people. But then now, labor market is still strong. So if you're bringing down borrowing costs, whereas the labor market is still strong, it will just exacerbate what a rebound of inflation. So for me, that is where my, my key focus is at. Yes, the chances of a recession have, high, have heightened in the U.S., uh, but if you look at the labor market, it's still defying those odds, right? In terms of there is though that we can see uh, uh, a, a boost of inflation because even cutting interest rates itself, what promotes inflation because it, it, it in terms of easing or lowering interest rates prom promotes inflation and it also boosts what? Asset classes or asset prices. Like we're seeing with the stock market rallying after the Fed had came out and said they're now starting to discuss what? Interest rate cuts. We now saw what S&P 500 uh, Nasdaq as well as the, um, the US 30, we said we saw them all rally up. Why? Because the 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 assumption is that if 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 the Fed announces that they're considering to cut interest rates, it would obviously, like I mentioned, it will increase spending of businesses and consumers, and that means that if it increases businesses, it increases the spending of businesses, and businesses grow, and also uh, in terms of business investments then that will cause the what the stock prices of those specific businesses to go up. And remember, indices are composed of what? Of businesses. So if the stock prices go up, then it results, it results in an increase in the asset, in the asset prices, essentially. Right. So that is where we stand. And that is something key moving forward in terms of the next data that we're getting. How is it impacting the economy?
specifically the labor market. That is what I'm that is what is really, really worrying me, of which we could potentially see a rebound in inflation. And going into this week that we're going into, uh, we are we are getting inflation data from the US on Friday, uh, sorry, on Thursday. Uh, and then PPI, which is producer price index on uh, Friday, right? And that is also expected. The, the headline inflation is expected to tick higher, uh, but the core inflation and all the monthly readings are expected to drop a bit, right? So going into this week, it will be a highly anticipated reading, uh, which could, could have severe volatility for the market, especially coming after the ISM data, which was disappointing. Uh, yeah, in most economists' views and also in my view, it, it was disappointing, but it is a telltale sign that the economy is potentially heading for a downturn, right? So maybe the Fed, that is what they were paying attention to uh, when they actually decided that they're going to come out uh, in December and talk about cutting interest rates. Uh, is there any questions based on what I've just covered so far? Uh, yeah, I've got a question, Mikey. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, it, it it makes sense what you're saying there. Uh, I, I I don't know if I I I read this correctly, but I noticed that um, history says, or in history, what happened was uh, the Fed increases and then they hold mm -hmm. and then they cut. Yep. It's like what they have been doing all along. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like it, it's been happening for 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 some time. Are yeah. you saying now in 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 the uh, uh, environment that we are in at the moment, mm -hmm. uh, there is a possibility that it won't happen like that. It will be now hiking, holding, and then hiking again. There is yeah yeah there is a possibility because the labor market is still tight. Because remember, with recessions, recessions it's generally falling inflation with an increase in unemployment. That is when you get cut off interest rates because inflation is falling, yeah. but unemployment is going up. So we cut interest rates so that we can do what we can boost the economy again. But now the labor market is still running hot. We in oh. and it's falling, but unemployment is, oh yeah. Unemployment is also falling if I may call it right. So not in an in, okay. in an environment because generally it goes in the opposite uh, in, in unemployment, they go in the opposite direction. Generally, when yeah, yeah, when, un yeah. When, un when unemployment is high, generally inflation is low. So they do what they boost the economy by cutting interest rates, and then eventually businesses start hiring, and then unemployment starts Correct. ticking down, and then inflation starts getting boosted because of the demand side, right? Then generally, mm. when we when we in a recession or trying to, or getting out of a recession, generally unemployment is high, inflation is low, growth is low. Right. So now they're in that situation where the, the labor market remains tight. It remains strong, but then inflation is dropping as well. Right. So remember yeah. what, what what is called what is the what is the demand side producer of inflation in the first place? It's what? It's high unemployment. So, sorry, high employment or low unemployment, employment. where a lot of people are working, businesses are hiring, businesses are growing, businesses are spending money, they're expanding, they're investing in new equipment, hiring people. So if if that is still happening, that means more people still have a paycheck, more households still have uh, possible income, so they can spend that income, even though interest rates are high. But if we're not seeing a downturn or a significant downturn in the labor market, then that means that there is still what room or there is still demand that is present in the mm. market. That that poses yeah. a risk to a rebound in inflation. So yes, they can cut, but remember, cutting will only exacerbate the labor market being tighter. Even though, yes, it's not an immediate effect. It's similar to hiking interest rates. You don't feel it immediately. It's a lag effect, but then it will also create that expectation in the market, right? That, okay, correct. Moving forward, it will be cheaper to borrow money. Moving forward, it will be cheaper to, to spend because you're getting money at cheaper rates. So people will be more inclined to start what? Uh, taking out mortgages, taking out car loans and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So that is where the problem is. Yeah. And also keeping in mind that even though this is on the side and it, the central bank has nothing to do with it, with it, remember what is happening in the Red Sea now 
we are having that fight between or there's there's the where they the the Houthis they are taking the ships right or the cargo vessels there, yeah. then move through the Suez Canal. What is that causing? A lot of companies are no longer transporting the ships because they use that they use that uh, the, the 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 Suez Canal as their mode of transportation or route. So what are they doing now? Some of them they said okay, we're not gonna transport goods at all, and some were like okay, they opted to go. All the way around. So instead of going at at the top of Africa, African continent, they're now going all the way around past Cape Town, so that they can reach their destination. So that what 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 is that doing? That is now creating a what a backlog in the supply chain. So what is that? Uh, that is, that means that it will take longer for goods to reach their destination. If goods take longer to reach their destination, that is already cutting supply of those goods. And if those goods are in high demand, what it will do, it will push up inflation. If those oil cargo vessels or oil transportation vessels cannot pass through the Red Sea, there'll be a backlog in or in terms of, of oil supply. What will that do to oil prices? Uh, shoot oil prices up. It will shoot shoot prices of goods or foods or whatever that is being transported there. It will be shot up. Because I remember BP was one of the first companies to be like, we're seizing all, all transportation via the, the, the Red Sea. And especially because it is escalating to a point now where there is a possibility of a full-blown war since the UK and the US came united, became united, and they're like, okay, we're going to protect the Red Sea. We're going to send our uh, military ships, our aircraft carriers to the Red Sea to survey the situation, to control the situation. And then, unfortunately, it resulted in the killing of around, I think, around 10 of those Houthis rebels, right, uh, from Yemen. And then now Iran also sent their warship to the Red Sea. And we understand Iran is obviously a proxy of two of the Houthis, of the, of the Yemen rebels. So that could also spark another war. And a war that is similar to what is happening uh, in, in Gaza between Israel and Palestine, because we understand that Palestine is also a proxy. By proxy, I mean close tie to Iran. Yeah. And Iran has been backing Palestinians, even though they haven't been fully involved. So now we understand also that Iran is also what a transporter of oil. So what could happen? Oil prices could be affected. Supply side of oil mm. could be affected. That could push oil prices high, and, that, and then we could have what a demand side, a a cost push side of inflation, and then we could see a rebound in inflationary pressures, right? So also with the labor market in the U.S. still being strong, it's it's quite tricky. Yeah, that's that's a very tricky one. That's a very tricky one. Uh, I I noticed as well. Yeah, team. it's quite but tricky. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah, but for the but uh, I'd say a benefit for the US is the fact that their growth is still strong. Okay. In terms of in terms of but, GDP. Yeah, but then uh, uh, just to I don't know if I'm throwing you off topic now. No. Uh, yeah. Going back to what I was uh, mentioning, uh, because I saw that the, 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 the market really priced in this interest rate cut. Are they also not looking at the fact that we are into an election year whereby uh, the, I don't know, the, 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 the central bank has to support the, the what we call this, the fiscal side, something like that? Yeah, no, 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 they are. They, also, they are also looking at that. Because remember, like we, like we, when we spoke, in our first uh, meeting, thing towards the end of December, yeah. when we spoke about the fact that, remember, it's like it's like the current president, like uh, Joe Biden, right? It's like in it during his time as the president, the stock market was able to hit all time highs or new or yeah, all time highs essentially. That is a good achievement, right? So that bolsters confidence in him as as president or in the ruling party if they were able to achieve such such a great feat, right? So all of those things could be contributory uh, moving into the election year, right? So all of those things might be the game plan. But if you're also now looking at the ISM data and what it is telling us, then you could see that in as much as that could be the possibility, but there is also a bit of cracks in the US economy. All right, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, so yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah, so in essence, that is what we had. I'd say the key events uh, that we had last week, and then moving into this week, like I mentioned, we have uh, CPI uh, inflation data, and it's gonna be pivotal uh, because if we do get a, a further 
slow down, then that could mean that they could possibly gear up for interest rate cuts, even though the labor market is still tight. Uh, but if we're seeing a rebound, then it could be uh, maybe a different story and maybe telling us that, yeah, what we're seeing with the labor data is being supported by inflation. Uh, but yeah, that is that is that is what we have going into this week. Remember is that because we also had the Fed minutes uh, being released. Another thing to remember is that they're still doing a quantitative tightening, right? If you all remember, quantitative tightening is essentially the selling of bonds or allowing bonds to mature and then they run off their balance sheet. Because remember, when, when they cut interest rates, they cut interest rates first and then they perform QE if they see that interest rates are no longer as effective or if interest rates are as close to zero, right? But the economy still needs some uh, boosting or some, or some assistance. So that's when they perform quantitative easing, which is buying bonds. But in this case, since they started tight, since they started hiking interest rates, they were performing quantitative tightening, which was the selling of bonds. Uh, and then... They've sold uh, nearly around 100 billion uh, in terms of uh, bond of in terms of bonds per month. So they've allowed that much to roll off of their of their of their balance sheet. Because remember, the, the Fed's balance sheet is predominantly made up of bonds, mostly securities. So they've allowed that much, and it has actually brought or reduced the balance sheet to around uh, 7.8 trillion. Remember, it it ranked up to almost doubled in size. Mm -hmm. Uh, during COVID, and it went up to nine trillion. So, so they've shaved off just slightly over one trillion dollars uh, in terms of the roll off. So that is still continuing, right? So that is still continuing in the background. And remember, the effect of that is similar to hiking interest rates. So they might talk about cutting interest rates, but they still have that running in the background. So once they also start signaling that, okay, we are now looking to slow down uh, instead of uh, shedding a hundred billion per month. Uh, maybe we are now looking looking to slow down and maybe shed 50 billion, right? So that that could also be laying a groundwork that okay, we are getting closer to doing out to doing what to potentially cutting interest rates. Because remember, before they started hiking interest rates, if most of you recall, they they were explicit in saying that they will start with tapering QE before they cut. So what was reducing the amount of which in, in, in amount, the amount of bonds they were buying per month so not that they were no longer buying bonds but they were reducing the amount so the opposite could possibly be true i haven't verified but based on my viewing it could possibly be true that they will start by signaling that they are with they are now looking to reduce the amount at which they are selling bonds in terms of allowing the bonds to roll over their balance sheet, maybe from 100 billion to 50 billion, before they actually come with interest rate cuts. Because we, well, the period we had that in was in November 2021. That is when they came out and said they will start tapering. Then in March 2022, that was when they came out and what? And hiked interest rates. So I, I feel it might be the same process where they'll initiate or actually come out and say that they're looking to slow down the, the, in terms of the size at which they are reducing their balance sheet before they actually look to cut interest rates so that they can lay the groundwork. Because remember, quantitative tightening has similar effects to hiking interest rates. So they can't run quantitative tightening at the same pace, but at the same time start cutting interest rates. I think they need to reduce the, the rate at which they they selling bonds first before they can then say, let us cut interest rates. And then eventually, if they cut interest rates further, and the economy is not budging. Let's say worst case scenario, there's a recession. Then they might, then they can step in and do what and do quantitative easing again by buying up bonds. But they can't switch from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing, or quantitative tightening to cutting interest rates. So I feel we also need to pay attention to the to the to the language there. If maybe they're looking to do what to slow down uh, in terms of the interest rate uh, cuts. Sorry, in terms of the bond purchases for the balance sheet. Uh, any questions on that? Nope. Uh, but for everything is clear. Yeah, I'm good, man. I'm okay. good, man. Okay. okay, Masanda, everything is clear. Yes, 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 bro. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so so essentially that is where we are uh, based on what is happening just 
focusing more on the U.S. economy because remember, bigger economies, U.S., uh, China, and then, of course, Europe uh, and tying it with the U.K. Uh, and we know the story with China. They also having their their CPI or inflation figures this week. And remember, they're in a contractionary environment uh, or deflationary environment, uh, as we know, because China's inflation is currently uh, in the negative territory. Right. It is currently sitting in the negative territory. So, yeah, that's essentially what I wanted to highlight there. And then if we can go into the spreadsheet, um, uh, can everyone see the spreadsheet now? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, we can. So, okay. so if we go into the spreadsheet, we can see that uh, we do have, uh, where's the inflation for China? So we can clearly see that China is sitting at, uh, inflation is sitting at negative. So from negative 0 0.2 dip to negative 0 0.5, I think it expected it is expected to dip further to negative 0 0.7, right? So that is what we're seeing with China. And obviously understanding if China is in a contract, if China's inflation is in a slowdown, uh, what will the central bank do? Everything opposite to what we explained with the dollar when the, when inflation was high. So they will, for them, they are, they are cutting interest rates, which is what they've been doing, even though they're sitting at 3.45. But the last two, the two, the previous reading towards the last meeting, they were actually cut interest rates, but they are trying to stimulate the economy. So for them, it's quantitative easing side, not quantitative tightening, like we're seeing with the Fed. For them, they are still buying bonds to start to, to increase the money supply in the economy. And then eventually, hopefully, that will boost the economy where we're seeing what, uh, in terms of inflation picking up because more consumers are spending, more businesses are expanding and growing. But there is a sort of a slowdown in terms of their recovery process, uh, like as much well, not as much as we had expected them to recover quickly. Uh, we're seeing that slowdown, and that is, of, of course, affecting economies like the Australian economy, which is highly dependent on exporting iron ore to China. So if we don't see growth in the Chinese economy, we can expect the Australian economy to be affected, especially because they also have their own stories with the housing market, where housing prices are quite high. 